Hey everyone, I'm Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at Restore. Thanks so much for checking out this week's video. I hope that it encourages you and I hope that it inspires you. And I hope that you have some community around you to be able to talk through some of these concepts and truths with. If you don't have community like that, we would love to invite you to be a part of our community here at Restore. You can learn all about it on our website at restoreaustin.org. So click there and get all the information that you need. I hope that we see you soon at one of our gatherings, and I hope that you enjoy this message. Hey, everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you. I'm so excited to be with Drew Hart today. Um, Drew and I have been uh, connected for a little while uh, via the Twitter, Twitter sphere, um, and uh, got to know each other a little bit through that, um, but I'm so excited that you guys are going to get to hear from him specifically around his latest book, um, Who Will Be a Witness, that I have here, and you can also see in the background of Drew's there, along with his first book, Trouble I've Seen. So if you don't know much about Drew, though, I want to just kind of drop a little bio on you. So Drew G.I. Hart is an assistant professor of theology at Messiah University and has 10 years of pastoral experience. He's the program director of Messiah University's Thriving Together, which is Congregations for Racial Justice program. And he's also the co-host of the Inverse podcast with Jared McKenna. Great podcast if you're looking for um, just top level spiritual content stuff. Hart is also the author of, like I said, Trouble I've Seen, Changing the Way the Church Views Racism, and Who Will Be a Witness, Igniting Activism for God's Justice, Love, and Deliverance in 2020. That was released. So He's also the recipient of BCM Peace's 2017 Peacemaker Award, the 2019 W.E.B. Du Bois Award in Harrisburg, PA, and was Elizabethtown College of 2019 Peace Fellow. You are winning Peace Awards like crazy, man. I love that. That is so cool. Uh, Drew and his family live together in Harrisburg, PA. So that's your bio, Drew. Um, but could you kind of tell us a little bit more about your story, your background, how you got to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. But first of all, just thank you for having me, Zach. It's a pleasure to be in conversation with you. And I hope this will be a, a meaningful and a blessing to those who are listening. Uh, my story begins, I mean, I, I could begin many places, but I guess I'll go back to you know, uh, born and raised in Norristown, Pennsylvania, part of the Philadelphia ecosystem, okay. <clears throat> and um, raised in a, uh, I was a PK, a church boy, so to speak, right? Yeah. Um, so um, if I wasn't at the courts one day, I was in church <laughs> the other day, right? That was, that was my life and my world. Um uh, yeah, siblings, both my parents um, have been such an impact on me. Um, and so right, without getting too much into the weeds of my story, just, you know, I did that, had, had a sense of calling it towards the end of school, high school, and decided I wanted to do biblical studies, ended up at Messiah, um, studying as a biblical studies major there, um, was introduced to this idea called Anabaptism while I was there. Yeah. I had never heard of Messiah's, I call Messiah Anabaptist light institution. <laughs> um, it's not like the Mennonite schools, like sure. East, Eastern Mennonite University or anything. Um, but the biblical studies department certainly has a strong ethos of okay. Anabaptism there from a wide range of different traditions. What did your, did your pastor or did your dad pastor a denominational church or what did you grow up in? Yeah, so I grew up in. It was officially non-denominational. Okay. I would have, I would tell folks now. I say we were Black Baptist without okay. the name, yeah. <laughs> and all our sister churches were Black Baptist, okay. and I think most people there were Black Baptist. Sure. Um, so, but but we wouldn't have called ourselves by. We were non-denominational. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so yeah, got introduced to Miss uh, to Anabaptism and stuff there. Really, it was a important time of being able to ask really critical questions questions to wrestle with my faith and ask questions around race and the church and stuff. All of that began in significant ways while I was there on campus. And then afterwards, I was a youth pastor for about four years in Harrisburg at a multiracial Anabaptist congregation there in the city. Um, then I left, went back to Philly. I um, actually was actually an assistant associate pastor at my home church oh, cool. for a little while. And I also, during that time, began to uh, get to connect with the broader, what I call the Philly Anabaptist world, okay. right, that existed there, um, that, that I was not aware of, that I was around, that didn't even know was right in your back, you know, um, uh, backyard, and yeah. so there's a really cool, like, Black Mennonites, Latino Mennonite, Asian Mennonite, like, it's just really this 
ecosystem yeah. of Anabaptism that doesn't look like what most people think of when you think of Anabaptists, right? Sure. Um, it's urban. It's I got my friend Juan. He's, you know, his church is in North Philly and it's like two thirds returning citizens, right? Wow. Yeah. This is an Anabaptist community. That's you crazy. got community development stuff. You got sanctuary movement going on in South Philly. The largest Mennonite church is an Indonesian majority Indonesian community in South Philly. Right? That's so cool. Um, so anyway, yeah. there's just this beautiful thing. And so um, interdenominationally, they actually gathered together at a, a, a community called uh, Kingdom Builders. Okay. And so I was actually going to that, even though I wasn't a part of an Anabaptist congregation, yeah. I was attending that. And so I had my foot in both of those worlds, Black church and Anabaptist spaces. And that became a, a pretty significant part of my ecclesial identity, even uh, on the edges of it. Um, and at the same time, I started my PhD program when I was back in Philly. Okay. And so I was at Lutheran Theological Seminary and, and I decided I wanted to bring all my questions together. Um, and yeah. so it was putting black theology and white and, uh, black theology and in a baptism and conversation together, okay. but then having them wrestle with the questions of the history of Christendom and sure. white supremacy, right. And sure. colonialism. And how do those two help us think through and navigate faithfully moving forward? And so anyway, so a lot of folks um, who have gotten to know me um, through social media know that at least back, I don't use it, the language as much, but I used to use the phrase anablactivism, right? Yeah, yeah. The term anablactivism. <laughs> yeah. And so a lot of people have known me for that, but that in some ways that's just my fun social media way of getting at this journey that I've had with yeah. these two different traditions that, I mean, there's a lot of other traditions that have shaped sure. me as well, but these two in particular, the black church and the Anabaptist community broadly have been very formative for me and continue to be ongoing dialogue partners. And so that shows up in my work and the way that I think about these yeah. issues and even the ways that I, I push back against Anabaptists in some ways, sure. and I think helpful ways that I think um, invite us to a deeper radical uh, discipleship to Jesus. Man, that's awesome. Um, before we get into kind of more content around, around the book and around kind of what you're trying to do, with igniting activism and all of that stuff. For those that may not be have have background or be aware, could you give us like a, a quick overview of like what is Anabaptism? What does an Anabaptist church look like? I know you're talking about how diverse the congregations are in Philly, um, yeah. but but kind of what is that? What, what is that or what does that look like? How is it different from you know? I'm, I grew up Southern Baptist, right? So I'm from the South, yeah. uh, born yeah. and raised here in Texas. Um, Southern Baptist and Anabaptist, uh, some crossover, but not a lot, right? So yeah, yeah. For, for those of us that don't know, or those watching that might not know, what is Anabaptism? Yeah, yeah. you know, I had not known what it was uh, until I was an adult, basically, yeah. in college, right? Because yeah. um, when I first heard the word Anabaptist, I was like, what, you're anti-Baptist? I know, I mean, same, What's man. going on, right? Like, same. You know, I'm taking this kind of personal, right? <laughs> no, but it's not anti-Baptist. Anabaptist, um, it comes, it, it, it's emerged during the 16th century. Um, so in the context, think of Luther and Calvin, right, and the radical reforma the Reformation that's taken place. Um, and, and within the Reformation, there's what they call a radical Reformation that's taken place. <coughs> so that's where the term Anabaptist comes. There's these folks that are pushing for a, a more committed uh, a way of discipleship that takes Jesus's, Jesus seriously yeah. in terms of community life, mutual aid, economics, breaking church and state relations. Yeah. Um, they have this peace ethic and rejecting of the sword and mm -hmm. kind of top-down coercive Christianity, and all of that kind of stuff is yeah. emerging. And it really, the thing that I like to emphasize that gets missed um, sometimes even in mainstream articulations of it is in the 16th century, you also have this poor peasants rebellion that's taking place. Mm. So the Anabaptists are actually a part of this ethos wow. of these poor peasants that are frustrated also with the economic exploitation yeah. and the church relations that are going on and all that. So it's this really powerful radical movement that's happening from below, from the bottom yeah. up. Um, some people have even dared to call it a, a 16th century European liberation theology, yeah, right? yeah. Um, which is an interesting way of thinking about Anabaptism, which doesn't always get caught when you listen to some of the more main, mainstream ways that maybe white Anabaptists talk about Anabaptism today, yeah. kind of lose sight of some of the praxis-oriented ways that um, had the economic critique going on as well. Anyway, so so you have that, but but Anabaptist itself just means rebaptizer. Gotcha. That's not what they would have called themselves. They would have not. They would have said their goal was not to rebaptize anybody, but that they believed that 
baptism shouldn't be coerced and it shouldn't be tied to the state either. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted to rebaptize, they wanted to baptize people for the first time is how they would say it. Um, And uh, because of that, it's a very subversive act when at that time in the 16th century, baptism was something the state had hold of, right? Yeah. And so it was a very subversive act to try to break away and not yeah. follow the civil law along yeah. with the ecclesial tradition that had been going on for quite a while. And so they were persecuted uh, severely, um, burned at the stake, wow. drowned by the thousands, tortured, uh, displaced. Um, it was it was actually very brutal. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's the the origins of it. Now, today, I mean, I often sum it down to, you know, what does it mean to take Jesus seriously, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and I would add, um, again, my interpretation would push that part of that taking Jesus seriously also is taking seriously power dynamics and social right. location, which I think gets lost in some mainstream Anabaptists. But I think it's about radical discipleship. It's about community, right? Not seeing faith as just an individualistic yeah. uh, journey, but it's communal. Um, and then also taking seriously the ethics of Jesus and how that shapes how we live in the world today. So that's oh. kind of the quick sum of Anabaptism. That's awesome, yeah. man. Uh, that, that, that blessed me. Um, yeah, I think uh, from not having deep experience with it, I, I definitely associate a lot with pacifism um, and uh, know, know most of you know Anabaptist kind of people speaking about it are, are pacifists and talk a lot about that specifically. But I love the undercurrent of what you're talking about, um, the, uh, the critique of power structures and economic inequality and stuff that goes along with that. But, but more broadly, taking the words and works of Jesus seriously, we just actually spent, those of, us that, that you're, those of you that are watching that have been a part of Restore, we've just spent an entire year um, in the life of Jesus, just, just walking through the life of Jesus. And what we talk about all the time is uh, taking him seriously, taking the things he says seriously, the things he does seriously, how those things affect our lives. So that resonates with me and I think with a lot of us that are listening, man. So I appreciate that. Um, okay, so... Let me get into this. So one of the things I love so much about this book, and let me pause and say we already gave away one copy um, of it kind of during the week leading up to this uh, time. And then in the Zoom call afterwards, it's open to anyone and everyone that I'll leave just some discussion. We're going to give away another copy of it. So if you haven't bought it yet, we're going to give two away. Um, if If you don't get one of the giveaways, you absolutely should buy it because it is very worth it. One of the things I love so much about the book is how it's focused on helping both individuals and congregations move toward Christ-like action, take Jesus seriously. So in the introduction, you say it like this, who will be a witness guides the church toward a nonviolent revolutionary faith that bears witness to Jesus, seeking God's deliverance through a visible grassroots community that is mobilizing and organizing itself from below, which you just talked about, to share love, seek justice, and to join God's delivering presence. So kind of my big question to kick us off is what prompted you to write this book and then what and who were you trying to kind of address and get at within its pages? Yeah. Yeah. So the origins of the book actually connect to the to the reception of my first book. Right? Okay. So I was actually speaking and talking to people about trouble I trouble I've seen in my first book. It's about anti-racist discipleship, yeah. white supremacy, you know, think just kind of framing it and thinking about it um, theologically and, and as followers of Jesus. And so I'm engaging and 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 it was received well and I'm grateful and I'm engaging folks all across the country. But I keep getting this question, right? I keep getting the question which is um you know, Drew, this this is great. We're, I see systems and new ways. I see power dynamics, races, hierarchy, all that stuff is great. But it seems like you want us to also work for justice, right? <laughs> that, that's, uh, it seems like you're inviting us to be in solidarity and to struggle for justice. But like, what do you actually mean by that? What does mm. it actually look like, right? Yeah. Um, and I got that question multiple times that there were congregations where like, all right, you, you were convicted. We, yeah. we, we get it. We see it. Um, but but we're not sure what exactly you imagine us actually doing, because this is more than just inviting us to, uh, you know, hold hands and sing songs and have potlucks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, to across the racial divide. There's something <laughs> else you're calling us into. And so um, in hearing that a few times, it, it sparked. I was like, all right, it seems like this is an area where there could be some helpful work yeah. and where while there is like there's. Uh, you can find like social change work, sure. right? Literature. You can find like 
uh, some racial reconciliation literature that's more like individualistic and stuff, or or sometimes there's folks who are writing on this, but it's like as individuals, Christians yeah. going out and engaging, like kind of convicted people do it. But what does it mean for communities to seek justice, yeah. right? Um, and so that was something I felt like I could speak into, yeah. something I had personal experience with, yeah. something I was passionate about, and something that I was also, let's be honest, frustrated with the church about, sure. right? Um and so I had recently, in fact, tying that together, I had recently moved back to Harrisburg. I'm teaching at Messiah now. And so in my first year, we were at this one church, um, smaller, kind of traditional church, but they had briefly had um, this couple there okay. that um, that were also actually from Philly. And, um, and I was like, oh, you know, this... Uh, couple seems a little more radical and they're willing to, you know, they want to get the church engaged in the community and the issues that are going on and they're preaching on these things. And so yeah. I'm like, all right, I, I could see myself joining in and trying to participate in what God is doing here in this yeah. space. Right. Well, the short story is after a year for multiple things that I talk about in my book, I want yeah. to get into the details. They get pushed out basically. Yeah. That's the short sum of it. Um, but but I remember afterwards that somebody had spoken to my wife um, after service and, and was saying like, you know, like, oh, you guys like that. They're, they're preaching. You like that social justice stuff. Yeah. Right. And and my wife responds, you know, like, oh, Drew would say, you know, that's just the gospel of Jesus or yeah. something. Right? I forget exactly <laughs> how she phrased it. But but I guess like, you know, it, it just hit me like how, the disconnect yeah. there is between. Um, actually seeking justice as followers of Jesus and, and what that might look like to have an imagination for what it means to be followers of Jesus that can actually speak and address the challenges that we're facing in our society today. Yeah. That's significant and it's huge. Yes. And we've got to actually work through this. And so how can I, as a theologian, not just, I mean, if it was just about social change, I could just sit, offer some book suggestions, right? right, right. But how do we um, challenge and shape um how do we enter into radical discipleship to Jesus? How do we grapple with our history, yeah. right? Um, how we got to where we are today um, and acknowledge the mangled history that exists. How do we uh, grapple with the life of the church and what it means to be the church yeah. in the most holistic uh, way that is partnering and joining in with what God is doing? Um, how do we actually then think theologically about social change yeah. and how that and what we can learn and where do those things intersect? That's good. Um, and what does it mean to live into our full calling, right, as people that love God? And so, so that's a big arch of it. And so for me, some of what I do uh, in the beginning of the book is the first two chapters are really about um, – you know, again, this radical discipleship idea, yeah. right, to Jesus. How do we undomesticate Jesus? Jesus has been so watered down. Yeah, no doubt. So domesticated, right? Um, whitened, westernized, everything. Yeah. And so how how do we um, re-see Jesus, uh, the Jesus found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And so yeah. I spend two different chapters kind of um, doing some of that. One is um, Jesus um, confronting the Jer Jerusalem establishment mm -hmm. in the Gospel of Mark, right? And we get to see the radical Jesus there. And the other one, which is one of my favorites, at least certainly for me, was yeah. the Jesus and Barabbas so right, chapter, which I know a lot of people appreciated that one yeah. as well. Um, seeing Barabbas, because I think we've domesticated Barabbas. No doubt. And I would say that in do domesticating Barabbas, we also further domesticate Jesus, right? Yeah, yeah. And so there's a relationship in terms of how we read Barabbas um, that relates to what we'll see in, in the person of Jesus. Barabbas shows up every single time in every single one of the gospels, right? Yeah. And it's, and it's, there's no, it's, it's not ambiguous what right. he's there for. The gospel is consistent, right? Yeah. Um, he was an insurrectionist. He was a revolutionary. Um, so why is this socio-political definition showing up about Barabbas at the end of the Jesus story? Hmm. What, what, what does that help us? Like, why is this important? We don't even, we don't even have like, Jesus' birth story in every right. gospel, but we got Barabbas every time, right? <laughs> That's a good word, yeah. Um, and so, and, and, and at the same time, we've, you know, made him into this, like, random serial killer, right? Yeah, he's yeah. just going out randomly killing people, and he's, I joke, I think in the book, what I say? He's, um, he, you know, we make him into, like, you know, the Joker or something, yeah. but in reality, he's more like Nat Turner, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, desperate, freedom fighter, like, yeah. that's how he sees it, but, but, but someone who deeply believes in God, right? right. He deeply, he's very, he's not a secularist yeah. uh, revolutionary, he's 
deeply believing that God is going to uh, liberate God's people this way. Yeah. Um, and so when we wrestle with that and wrestle with the fact that Jesus and Barabbas both care about the lived conditions of suffering people in their yes. midst, yes. both deeply, right? Yeah. Then it enters us into a different conversation, especially God, Matthew's gospel, where we see um, uh, this, who do you want? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, Yeshua, right? Uh, the one who saves, yeah. the one who liberates. Who, yeah. who do you want as your liberator, right? Barabbas, yeah. son of the father, right? Yeah. Um, uh, it's powerful, striking yeah. contrast between these two. And so it invites us to think about the way in which we are actually going to uh, seek God's liberation, right? Yeah. Um, it's not that Jesus's liberation is spiritual and his is socio-political right. right. it's both are on the ground right. um, but they have different means for going about it they yeah. both actually want some similar things yeah. um, but they're going about it in different ways um, and yet jesus is throughout the gospels empathetic rather than condemning right. of of what's coming right yeah. for those who take the barabbas path yeah. luke 19 he weeps over jerusalem yes. right weeps over jerusalem if only they had known the things that make for peace for mm. shalom yeah. so anyway i think that th these kind of readings of careful readings of the gospel stories help us to see jesus in his first century context as a first century palestinian jew living under roman occupation yeah. uh, proclaiming a radical kingdom another yes. reign right yes. uh, a new world to come a new social order um, that has broken into our world and is uh, going to continue to do so. Yeah. And so anyway, these are um, important texts that I think should anchor us before we can even talk about social change and right. how we're going to engage in the world. Right. We've got to immerse ourselves in the birth, life, teachings, death and resurrection of Jesus and allow that to shape our imagination. I often use the phrase Jesus shaped imaginations, yes. right? Yes. Um, because too often Christians today, we have uh complicit and complacent uh, imaginations that are anchored to the status quo as it is right. rather than what God is doing um, and what God um, has done in Jesus Christ. And so we've yes. got to radicalize our imaginations um, to enter into the story of Jesus in the way that it does. Um, and maybe that, as so many people are talking about Christian nationalism today, yeah. that, that could solve a lot of our problems, right? Yeah, no uh, of Christian nationalism, um, if, if we were to really immerse ourselves slowly in the life of Jesus. So anyway, radical discipleship. But then I also grapple pretty significantly with our, our history. Yeah. Not only the history of Christendom, but then also how that inf uh, uh, keeps unfolding into the story of colonialism, right? right. And white supremacy. And I think that's the the church history portion that sometimes gets dropped off, right? Yeah. I'd say this is my critique of even in Anabaptist the space. They've got a devastating critique as it relates to Christendom. And then they usually stop short and don't wrestle with um, the colonialism that follows, yeah, right? Yeah. Which is really just uh, mutating it is, that yeah. Christian supremacy and coercion, right? right? It's just a mutation of that further. And so you have this uh, devastating history where the church, you know, 15th century, you have a papal bull. Well, actually, first in the 1440s, you have Portugal, who actually begins enslaving um, right. Africans, right? right? So you have the Christian West, that's how they see themselves, yeah. uh, engaging in, the, in, in slavery. Um, it's not the Atlantic slave trade yet, but it's a right. Western European country engaging in slavery of African people. And then you have a decade after that, a papal bull written that gives permission for them to do that right they do the theological heavy lifting yeah. they go say go reduce to perpetual slavery dominate plunder like all it's horrific when you yeah. actually read the actual language it's it's horrific of what was actually encouraged and so the church is doing theological heavy lifting contorting itself yeah. um to uh to uh to be an accomplice yeah. in the plundering right yeah. of people and lands and resources and so you have that. Then comes Christopher Columbus. Sometimes we start there, sure. 1492. Yeah, but yeah. It's, there's all this other stuff yeah. already at work that we've got to, that we've got to be attentive to. So Christopher Columbus comes, and then there's this horrific violence of indigenous people yeah. in the Americas, right? Um, so all of this is facilitated by a diseased theological imagination, if we're going to use Willie James Jennings' yeah. uh, language, and. Um, and so, yeah, for us to grapple with that and that white supremacy births out of that. Yeah. And the significance of that, if we don't miss it, is that 
when we recognize that, then it's not merely that the church has been complicit in racism, but the church literally birthed modern racism as we know it into the world today. Those are two different things, right? Complicit is like, oh, bad worlds. Oh, we got a little caught up in the moment. No, we didn't just, if anything, the the broader society got caught up in our problems, right? Our diseasing of Christian imagination, our mangling of the traditions, our displacing and domesticating of Jesus and his way, right? That's what took place. And we've got to grapple with the impact and the, the, the horrific uh, suffering that has come because at the hands of the church. Yeah. And yes, white supremacy now has taken on a life of its own. So it doesn't right. take a Christian, a distinctly Christian imagination anymore to live on, right? right? It's kind of lived on beyond itself now, yeah. but it began as that. And in some ways still is sure. a theological heresy, right? right. That, that distorts God's good creation, that distorts what it means to see people all made in the image of God right. and our shared humanity um, and the way that we ought to um, walk and live and move and interrelate with one another. And so all of that is there. Um, so anyway, so we have that history that we have to grapple with. And I talked a little bit about black church tradition and yeah. the prophetic tradition, which we just got to remember these, there's these resources at work yes. that we can draw from and learn from. Yes. Um, but, but important for me, again, before we start talking about social change work is what does it mean to be the church, right? right? What does it mean to be the church? Um, and I think that for us, it's it's easy, I think, in our current moments to imagine that the church doesn't really matter, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, that I can just be a, it's just me and God, Christianity. Yeah. And what's interesting is it's very popular in, in, in even Christian progressive spaces. It's oh, kind absolutely. of me and Christianity. And so that people talk about deconstructing, deconstructing and decolonizing. And yet it's actually internalizing deeply the enlightenment logics of yes. individualism, right? Yes. That actually Christian, the church itself runs counter to that, right? right? This kind of hyper individualistic way yes. of living and yes. moving and thinking. And that, I mean, it's, it's Cyprian in the third century. I mean, he's like, you know, outside of the church, there's no salvation, right? right? right I mean, yeah. these radical statements. Yeah. Um, and so for us to imagine that I can just have a solo me and God right. experience, uh, without actually embodying the reign of God, making mm. visible in community with others, interrelating with others, the practices, right, yeah. of confession and lament and sharing resources, yeah. right, and embodying God's new, God's new thing that God is doing in the world. Yeah. All of that needs to be fleshed out. And so I think a lot about in, in those chapters about power dynamics yeah. um, and community and what our lives revolve around and how we can reimagine how to engage those things as well as worship, right? And what does it mean to be a worshiping community? What's the relationship between our worship of God and justice work, right? Um, For me, those things are inseparable from one another. Um, That, it's clear that that we worship the, a God of justice, right. that we worship the God that delivered the Israelites out of Egypt, yeah. or the delivering God. What does it mean to to see with uh, Hebrew scriptures the way in which it sees, you know, what does God require of you but to do justice, yeah. to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God, right? Yeah. Um, these things are not separated. Um, you know, the God is disgusted by their worship. What does he really want? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like ever flowing streams, right? We could go on Isaiah 58, a powerful example of that kind of critique. Jeremiah 7, another powerful, devastating critique on the Jerusalem establishment that thought that they're all good just for being the, you know, the religious leaders, right, Uh, over the temple. And so um, there's a devastating critique and that fulfills even in the person of Jesus, Jesus Uh, echoes, right, and fulfills that same critique. Matthew 23, 23, we see Jesus critiquing uh, the religious leaders. Yeah. Um, and he's like, look, you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, right? you all religious. Yeah, yeah. So good tithing the windowsill plants. Yeah. But you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, That's mercy, right. faithfulness, right? right? Yeah. Um, and so it's the same tradition, right? Yeah. That Just he's singing. He's a part of this it. chorus yes. that fulfills it in his own body, in his own life, and invites us to see the connection that our faithful worship and offering to God um, is, 
is justice, yeah. right? That that's a part of our lives, how we love one another and love our neighbors and care for those who are vulnerable and speak up and confront evil, sure. overcoming evil with good, that that's the kind of life that we're supposed to live. So our worship life, our encounters with the living God, with the resurrected Jesus yeah. ought to, yes. <laughs> if it's an authentic encounter, ought to then be sending us out right. um, to be people that seek and do justice in the world. Um, so those are really important. Ooh, that's good. Um, so anyway. That's yeah. Good. And then last, you know, I, I, I wrapped the book up just thinking about and this is probably what people were actually asking. Right. When they actually asked the question, you know, what does this mean? What does this look like? Yeah, the, I do give them that. I got them. I got them there. But I wait till the end of the book because I don't want just 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 to be thinking about what to do. I love that. Without also thinking about the discipleship. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so. So I present um, just different social change methods and approaches that I think are really conducive for the life of the church, yeah. that are compatible with faithful discipleship to Jesus Christ. They don't have us abandoning the way of Jesus, right? right? right. Um, because we think our way is more reasonable, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, um, and so, but at the same time, not doing it in such ways that think that we can talk about faithfulness and effectiveness. We right. don't have to not talk about effectiveness. I know that there's some Christians that, oh, oh well, we can't talk about effectiveness at all. Right. No, I actually care quite a bit about actually relieving uh, the suffering of others. Absolutely. I actually want to see change, right? And so so where these two things can come together, I want to participate in what God is doing. In yes. fact, I love, again, going back to that Luke 19 passage, if only they had known the things that make for yes. peace, the things yes. that make for shalom, right? That there are some ways, right? That's what the early Christians known as the people of the way, right? Yeah. What is this way and how does it participate in God's cosmic uh, restoration of all creation, right? Yes. And the unfolding and transfiguration of creation. And so, <clears throat> so if we can participate in that, um, how do we lean into that? And so I think, um, again, Jesus' peacemaking, Jesus' right. liberation on the ground in solidarity with um, with those, you know, the least, last, and lost in society give us an image of, of the kind of work and kind of people that we ought to be. And then to think about what does it mean to do that in a um, democratic republic, right? right. Um, and so I think I talk about nonviolent movements and theory and how that relates to the life of Jesus. I talk about organizing and movements yeah. and the differences between the two and a hybrid work and getting yes. also the weeds of some of that and some of my own experiences working um, in my own community around that. Um, and, and really also challenging the church on one hand to not be afraid of politics, right? Yeah. And political engagement. Yes. But on the other hand, um, to not allow uh, political platforms to right. to puppet us, yes. right? Which I think is so often the case, so often. Um, whether conservative or progressive, that yes. we become aligned to political platforms that have been created by some elites in some back room, right, right. rather than starting among uh, the vulnerable, right? And those who are disproportionately suffering yes. and as followers of Jesus, seeking to be faithful and following him in partnership, in solidarity, in accompanying uh, those that disproportionately suffer, how do we then seek to bring change from that point with their stories, their stories held as sacred, right? Yes. Um, as a starting point. So anyway, just reorienting the power dynamics so we don't start top down, right. but uh, the kingdom of God that's bubbling up from the, from, from the grassroots, right? Yeah. Um, and, then, and then with all of that, then how do we love one another? How do we love each other? Um, I wrap up with that with a little, yeah. a little jazz with King and Howard Thurman yeah. and Jonah, right? And yeah. others and stuff. So, so I think that, you know, um, all of that I think is really important. It's just in some ways, on one hand, it's a lot. And obviously I'm bringing scholarship that most people don't always have accessible to sure. them. Um, so there's certain things that they might not know. But on the other hand, like some of this is about Christian, basic Christian practice, right? right. right? Um, and so how do we recover what it means to be followers of Jesus? Yes. Um we're even, and I missed it. I talked, I didn't even talk about my economics chapter, but like basic, we think reparations is a bad word, right? right, right. In our society today, but that's a deeply Biblical. Christian idea. Yeah. Um, in fact, most of the early Christians are much more radical than we are as it relates to economics. Sure. And I give some examples of that as well. Um, and so I think that we can, um, 
yeah, there's hope for the church, not in terms of us being perfect people, yeah. but in actually following Jesus and yes. taking Jesus seriously. And that actually meaning something and making visible God's reign for our neighbors, yeah, right. um, that the Jesus story could be made visible, right? Yes. As we live it out, they can see that happen, but we can do that collectively. It's not Lone Ranger work. No. It's community work. It's yeah. stuff that we come together and do and encourage one another yeah. in. And, um, and that can, and that can be, one of the most meaningful ways that we can respond to the legacy of mangled, distorted yes. Christendom, coercive Christianity, white supremacy, all that stuff. Let's embody the good news actually for our communities. Man, that's so good, Drew. Um, thanks for that walkthrough. I, it, one of the things that I love so much about the book that I was constantly confronted with, and this is not just the book, this is honestly um, a larger conversation for me that I've been on for a few years now, but, but I also see it show up whether it's just in your personal social media on the inverse podcast or whatever it is, but, but it's, it's this idea of constantly asking how much of my understood faith experience is like based on my station, my culture, my country, and how much of it actually based on scripture and the person and work of Jesus. Right. And yeah. we see that all the way back to Constantine to what you're talking about with um, Christendom and colonialism and all of that stuff where, where you had, these versions of Christianity significantly more shaped by societal goals or societal norms or something like that. One of the ways that I see that like crazy in our world today is that especially, you know, kind of Western white Christians specifically, we have made Christianity about an intellectual assent to a doctrinal statement, right? That, that's what being a Christian is. Like, are you willing to intellectually assent to these doctrinal statements? Um, and everybody's doctrinal statement is different, you know, depending on your background, denomination, whatever it is. But that's the that, that's the the litmus test. That's the rise and fall of it. What you actually do, your lived life matters very little compared to what you will agree to. And you, I, I love how much of the entire book is undergirded with scripture. But you also bring in scholarship, like you talked about, church fathers specifically. You quoted Cyprian earlier. You have a great quote from Cyprian in the book. Um, or a different one from 256 AD, where he says, beloved, talking to the Christians in the church, we are philosophers, not in words, but in deeds. We exhibit our wisdom, not by our dress, but by truth. We know virtues by their practice rather than boasting of them. We do not speak great things, but we live them. I, I just like, it's, it's so, so good. And you connect that really deeply to this whole idea of what does it actually look like to live and follow Jesus and how does that manifest itself in love? Because this undergirding idea of God is love, he's called us to the great commandment of loving him and loving others. So later you say, um, love pursues the well-being of others concretely in action, very simply stated, right? So it's less about an intellectual ascent and more about this love moving in us and through us by the power of the spirit. And so my question is, why do you think we have moved so toward Christianity being an intellectual ascent rather than a life of love expressed as we see so consistently throughout the biblical narrative? Yeah, I mean, I think that some of the reason is because um, it, it has a lot to do with our own desires and goals, right? right. Um, what do we want for ourselves, <laughs> And what do we want for society? And what are our allegiances, yeah. right? So if my allegiance is, let's say, the nation state, yeah. <laughs> if my goal and personal desires is to thrive in this nation state, yeah. um, then all my ethics are going to be yeah. contorted and to what's best for the nation state, right? right? Um, um, and, and, and for me within it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that's going to be. And so, and because Christianity and the nation state have been so enfleshed yeah. and meshed together, um, it doesn't take long before we have to begin to domesticate Jesus. Yes. We have to domesticate the calling. Yeah. We have to domesticate Christian formation and Christian discipleship. Um, the very things that ought to, form us into a kind of people that know how to love people, right? Mm -hmm. um, and love well. And so I think that, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost inevitable, right? Yeah. The moment that you, that our gaze is off of Jesus and seeking first God's reign, that other things are going to take that and it's going to shape us into a different kind of people. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, I think that we've got to reckon with 
um, what are our desires, what are our hopes, and in what ways have we committed ourselves to the status quo yeah. rather than God's reign and what God is doing. I think that that is fundamentally the big, the, that's that's a game changer, Absolutely. right? Yes. Um, it's a game changer. And so, yeah, I, there's going to be very little hope until we address even, and it sounds weird to say, but our desire. Right, right? absolutely. Because, because then, of course, we don't want to talk about practicing the way of Jesus, right? We've got to find a way to make this this Christianity thing fit with my way of life. Right. As it is, right? right? <laughs> I'll give an example. Um, I joke, I do this all the time. In fact, I might say it in the book. I can't remember what I say in the book when I don't, but I certainly <laughs> joke with my students. And I say, I talk about like the cross, how we talk about the cross, yeah. right? Um, so the cross, you know, um, you know, everyone, you know, everybody, every Christian knows talking about like, taking up their cross for Jesus, yeah. bearing the cross for Jesus, you know, so someone, you know, gives them a funny look one day because they're wearing their Christian t-shirt, you know, hey, they're bearing their cross for Jesus, <laughs> you know, they trying to go to the mall, the parking spot's gone, <laughs> uh, they're taking up their cross for Jesus, someone's <laughs> got to do it though, it's okay, Christian persecution is a part of the story, right. you know, <laughs> In the middle of the winter, their electric blanket breaks down, right, <laughs> their cross to bear, right, That's right man. Um, and so, so what we've done is we've done all these mental gymnastics and uh, work and kind of contorting to domesticate what is first century palette, first century uh, state execution, right. Right. And torture. (laughs) That's what we're talking about and make it fit into the American life. Yes. Right. Um, But if you were to actually think about Jesus's teachings on take up your cross, it's not about intellectualizing. It's actually about a practice of confronting evil and being faithful yes. in the way uh, t- towards God's way of yes. life, right? Yes. And God's reign to the point of accepting the consequences, exactly. even death, yes. even first century execution under Rome, yes. right? Like that's what, that's what the cross means. Yeah. Um, and so, but it's about a practice then. Right. It's about actually living something out. Right. Um, but if we can somehow think about the cross and yeah. contort it in such ways that we can somehow still be faithful without changing anything about right. our lives, right. then, you know, so I think that that's, that's at the heart of it is we've intellectualized yes. it because intellectualizing it can fit in with, the, the spirit of the enlightenment, right? Yeah. And all that we were, we're rational totally. people and, and everything is of, of the mind and stuff. Yeah. And so how we live and even our own hearts don't yeah. matter as much as yeah. as what doctrines we've consented to. Yes, yeah. yes. Oh man, that's so good. You're exactly right. Um, and it's so well put. I, <laughs> it is such a joke. A lot of times how we talk about taking up your cross or how we talk about Jesus saying the world will hate you, you know, and like you talked about, you got something bad happen to you, you get overcharged at a restaurant or something. You're like, hey, the world's going to hate me. You know, Jesus said that. I'm not. I mean, it's, it's such a joke. But, you know, I think about how um, really when, when, it, when it comes down to it, caving into our own personal desires, co- co-opting, contorting the way of Jesus to fit with our lifestyle instead of actually pursuing his way really is sinful, right? It, it, it's sin. And I love that you talk about sin in the book um, because we have been given this word as Christians that d- so so helpfully describes moving against the way of Jesus. And if we really understand sin, we back up, we understand God's desire from Genesis to Revelation and, and manifests especially through the personal work of Jesus is to bring life and life abundantly, to, to, to bring shalom uh, abundant goodness in all things and between all things, to quote Lisa Sharon Harper. Like w- when we understand that, then we see sin as anything that is disrupting shalom, is preventing it, whether it's in me or through me to somebody else or whatever it looks like. And you make this statement in the book that I just found to be so good. You, it's very simple. You said social sin does exist, but so does personal sin. And I feel like we are in a world right now where people really end up focusing on one or the other. We either kind of over-spiritualize and over-personalize everything, or we kind of systematize everything and we refuse to look inward and say, where's my own complicity in this? Where's my own desire um, leading me away from the way of Jesus? So how can we take both of them seriously? Yeah, I mean, and I, I like the fact that you even brought up shalom, because yeah. I think for me that is the orient, the orienting like frame to like shape our imaginations, yeah. right? 
is this idea of shalom, which is, it's not just like, I mean, so in the U.S., you know, we have our language of peace, which is, again, so domesticated right. and so weak and, and means almost nothing, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but this shalom in the biblical sense is this, as you said, intertwines all of creation, right? Yeah. Um, that we are a part of. We yeah. are a part of creation, right? Yeah. We're not outside of it. Right. <laughs> My uh, friend Jared always jokes about how, you know, we talk about nature, right? As yeah. thing, this nature, I love nature. <laughs> no, we're a part of creation. Right. We're all, and, and so when we, when we realize it and grapple with how we relate to God, to others, to ourselves, to, to the earth, um, that there's, that framing, that holistic way of thinking about it, then gives the picture of what God desires for us, right? This, as King would call it, beloved community, yes, right? Yes. Um, and, and so in what ways am I not participating in pursuing that? Yes. In what ways um, have I severed good, faithful relationship with others, yeah. right? Um, in what ways am I, am I not living in responsibility to and for others yeah. and with others, right? Um, uh, in what ways have I engaged in idolatry yeah. and, and displaced God's place in our lives, right? I mean, I was, white supremacy is fundamentally about idolatry. Right, right? absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's about a hierarchy and yeah. putting ourselves in, in a wrong order yes. uh, before God and before others. And yeah. so um, all of these things, and, and it is easy to point the finger outward at yeah. others yeah. If, if you're on the progressive side, right? Sure. That's the leaning is, yeah. is to point out and be like, oh, you know, those bad folks over there and yeah, those yeah, systems yeah. out there, yeah. shame on you. Yes. And we don't see that sin runs through all of us exactly. and that we're all being pulled and, and, and turned in ways that are not leading towards shalom, that are not leading towards beloved community. And so, yeah, that first question that we've got to ask is our own complicity yes. um, in these systems and the, in the ways that we also have hard hearts at times, yeah. right? Even folks who work for justice, right? right? I was just having a conversation earlier with a, my friend Carol from Kenya, Masingi Trust, and just thinking about the ways that, you know, sometimes we don't always, you know, the person is struggling and we're kind of apathetic and we can respond in the same way that yes. we will critique someone yes. else for doing, right? Exactly. Um, and so I think that we've got to really be honest and do some self-examination before God and ourselves yeah. about our own lives and our own failures and have some humility um, around that. And then it actually creates a much better way to engage others when we can be aware of um, the way that we are sinful and complicit yeah. in these systems and have allowed these evil forces at work to to overtake us, yeah. right? And our own desires and our own commitments and our own lives. And so, um, yeah, all of that is good and, and invites us then to take seriously our own formation, our own habits, yes. our own practices, exactly. right? Exactly. Um, and that think we can't think our way out of this. Yes. Right? <laughs> um, um, <laughs> just being smart people will not uh, solve the problem. Right. Um, and then we're invited into to repent, to confess and repent and lament and to live into a new way, into God's way. And so all that is important. And then also, though, um, without minimizing at all, Absolutely. the prophetic critique right, Absolutely. of the social systems Absolutely. and the call to confront evil. Um, and to speak truthfully without af being afraid of the consequences because yes. the ultimate threat of death no longer has its sting on us, yes. right? Because um, God has, Jesus, God and Jesus Christ has conquered death. Yeah. Um, and so what does it mean to, to have that prophetic witness yes. in the world um, and recognize that all of scripture is deeply, deeply has a, devastating social and, right. and political critique, right? Yeah. It's devastating. Yes. Um, and to miss that, to just domesticate and spiritualize everything yes. um, when Jesus is clearly invested quite a, quite a bit in how the world is organized and yeah. how it impacts uh, the the poor and the vulnerable women, right? And the Samaritans yeah. and those who've been stigmatized in their yes. society. Jesus is deeply concerned about these things and we ought to as well. So yeah, sin is a language that is actually a gift for us to do I some yeah. examination of our own lives, our own communities, and our own society, um, and an opportunity uh, to repent and to live into something um, much more beautiful yeah. um, that God desires for us. Oh man, that's so vitally important. So vitally important. 
Um, well, man, honestly, I could I could do this with you for hours, but I'm be respectful of your time and our our church's time as they're watching this. So I want to ask you kind of one more question that I'm going to ask you to pray for us. So the last question really is, I'd, I'd love for you to just give us a couple of quick things um, that a church like us, you know, a, a body of believers in urban Austin, Texas, um, what can it look like for us to take some of these steps toward um, community-based justice, not just individuals going out? Because like you say in, in the book, one of the strangest trends among Christians committed to the work of justice is that many do it alone as individual agents rather than as organic ways of participating in the life of the church. Their faith might ignite them to do justice, but not in concert with their faith community. So, so how can a church like us just, just do better at that? A couple of quick things. Yeah, I mean, I would say that one of the things first is to study the communities that have been doing this collectively. I do think that, mm. and, and to be fair, not all black churches have engaged in this work. Sure. Right? So it's not over, Yeah, but there's this, prophetic tradition yeah. of the black church that I think is really beautiful and powerful. And I think that that's a resource. It's a gift Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, to the broader church yeah. um, that ought to be taken seriously. So some of it is learning from others because there's the songs and worship and collective yeah. communal life um, that can be drawn on um, for other churches as well. Um, so that would be one of the things. Um, and I do think that, you know, for us to interrogate our, our worship practice mm -hmm. is really important, right? To think, um, and it's tough. It's because, I mean, the worship industry and all right. that stuff is so, and and so it's, sometimes it's hard work to figure out, yeah. like, you know, how do I form form people in ways that are actually meaningful? Yeah. But we've got to do that hard work. We've Absolutely. got to grapple our way out of all of this. And so we need folks writing new songs and, yeah. you know, the communal life together, all of that matters. I talk about, um, creating space, dialogical space to have conversations, yeah. right? Really, let's have hard conversations about things that matter yes. and seeking God, attending to what God is doing, um, wrestling, listening um, in an anticipating way that sometimes God might speak through folks that I might not expect, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not always just uh, the one with the PhD or the pastor yeah. or whoever, like sometimes, uh, but we've got to do it in ways that are discerning, right? doesn't mean that anything everyone says is good either. Yeah. We've got to learn how to discern as communities together. Um, and I think that that's important. Um, so yeah, I think that um, all of those things, and then um, join in with what others are doing already, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm big, big, big advocate for, let's not try to always recreate the wheel, yeah. right? Um, who's already leading? Who's most vulnerable? Who's most impacted? Let's join in and be learners, yeah, right? Yeah. With those who are already doing the work, joining in, linking in with it, and and recognizing that your interpretation of what's happening may not be That's the right. best take, especially sure. not early on, right? Yeah. Um, and so trust the perspectives of others um, until you gain some new eyes for how yeah. to see and understand what's going on and why people are doing things the way that they do. Um, and so that takes some humility, right. Exactly. To enter in. Um, and, but we, we got to study. I do right. think that um, social change actually requires um, some intention. Go get some, get the church doing some like nonviolent training yeah, right, yeah. together or something yeah. or bring somebody in or, you know, I don't know. There's all kinds of stuff. Um, Cause it's a discipline. It's actually a discipline, is, right? Yeah. Dr. King understood very, very well it was a discipline and that he needed to actually train people um, into the work. And so, yeah, there's so much stuff. And so I think if we take seriously Jesus yes. and then bring in that other stuff um, as a contextual way to live that out for our time, I think that um, we can actually engage in meaningful ways that I think people are hungry for right now. Absolutely. People want to see the good news lived out in meaningful ways. Yeah. Um, and I think it would be even a shock for some yeah. folks when it's the church of all, t of all folks, right. Yes. Doing it these days. Oh man, you're so right. And I think that humble posture too, whether it's the humble posture of a learner, the humble posture of a listener, whatever it is. I mean, I, that, that's so important. And, and one of the things I love about you, man, is that I, I think you really embody that. I just think you have such a humble posture. Um, one of the reasons I know that is because when I asked for resources, you didn't even mention, you know, the book. But I'm telling you, this is fantastic. Um, and Drew is just an incredible dude and not going to toot his own horn on this thing. So if, if you haven't gotten it, um, Who Will Be a Witness and Trouble I've Seen are both fantastic resources for exactly what we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes or so. So Drew, thank you again so much for being with us, um, for, for gracing us with your wisdom, your knowledge, um, and your experience, man. We are absolutely better for it. Uh, I'd love for you to just close us in a word of prayer if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. That's right, great. God, 
God, uh, creator, sustainer, uh, we just acknowledge you. Uh, we give thanks for another day. We give thanks for the gift of life. We give thanks for our relationships and the opportunity to be in church and community with others and for what you're doing in our lives. Um, we give thanks for your grace and your love and the way that you invite us into your divine activity and work in the world. God, we pray that we would just be attentive to what you are doing, to what you're up to, help us to slow down, to pay attention to the spirit at work. God, we pray that we would join in, mm -hmm. that you give us the courage and the humility and um, the strength to, to do and be the people you've called us to be. God, I pray that we would also be attentive to one another and to attend to those that are often um, ignored, yeah. dismissed, silenced. Um, help us to attend to their stories and experiences and uh, allow them to shape us and to change us um, so that we can learn how to love the way that you called us to love. God, I pray that you would give us uh, an imagination that is um, creative um, in the work of justice and peacemaking. Um, help us to strategize and put our minds together to think about how we can, um, you know, scheme and plot for good. Mm. And so, God, we pray that um, that as we join you, God, that we would overcome evil with good and um, again, make visible the story of Jesus for others, we pray. We give thanks again. We praise you. We lift up your name. In Jesus, amen.